There we go. Now we're going to talk about that. And so we're going to be in Genesis chapter 40 tonight. Uh, as we're going to kind of continue the conversation that Josh led us in uh, last night, uh, I'll try to do it uh, in about 45 minutes, 50 minutes. I'll try to get you about a 10-minute break before the kids come back in. Uh, we'll see how that goes. We may or may not do that, but we'll try. So we're going to, we're going to be in, here in Genesis chapter 40. And, and in this conversation, we could almost call it doubt, difficult circumstances. I, I think there's a lot of different names we could give this situation uh, in Genesis 40. Uh, so we, we're coming off of the conversation about conflict. And, and I thought Josh did a, a fantastic job. I'm wedged uh, against two very fine uh, speakers in the brotherhood, and, and that's very kind of, of them to make me a, a sandwich between two great speakers. And so I'll do my best to, to hold you uh, until tomorrow. Uh, I'm confident that Zach is tomorrow night's speaker um, because Josh had conflict, I have doubt, and I'm sure Zach has triumph because um, he always gets the cool ones. So, um, I'm just kidding. I, he is, though. You are, aren't you? So Zach will be back tomorrow. Uh, so he, he, took, he took triumph, and he gave me doubt. But I, I really do like this lesson. I think it's some good conversation. And I'm, gonna take, uh, I'm not going to use two verses out of his. I'm just going to tell you what happens in them because uh, I don't want to steal any of his, his, his material. Uh, but I, you're going to have to know that in order for us to get to the end of our lesson tonight. So as we get into Genesis chapter 40, I, I want us to, to take a look at our topic. It's always time to depend on God. And tonight it's in times of doubt. I think it's a really cool subject that we get to talk about, that in any situation, in anything that we do, it is the proper time to depend on God. In the highest of highs in our life, in the lowest of lows, and everywhere in between, it is always time to depend on God. And so as we look at doubt tonight, as we look at Joseph in what is a very difficult situation, we, we, we kind of led into it last night. If you were in the class last night, you saw that that his dealing here with Potiphar's wife, that he has done everything right. He did everything that he was supposed to do. She, she continued to tempt him. She continued to try to entice him. And through all of that, he tried to do right, and she lied. And he ended up, as we wrapped up last night, he ended up in prison. Now, as Josh mentioned, and the point that he made uh, was, was, I thought, a fantastic one. He should have, had it not been that either Potiphar still saw some favor in him or uh, that Potiphar didn't totally believe the situation. He probably should have ended up dead. Um, and luckily, in addition to that, much like what we're talking about in Exodus, God had some involvement in that as well. And we're going to be able to learn from this event by his life remaining. But he is not going to be spared from prison. You see, I, I think often when we think about our circumstances and often when we consider the situations that we're in, we don't give God enough credit that even, even in our situations that we wouldn't say we're really excited about, they're better than they could be. <laughs> They're better than, than they could have been. See, and, and I think that, and, and I, 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 Josh made some really good points, and, and I'm going to get to a quote here. I want, I want to point out one more. But I, I, I used three quotes tonight. Uh, the first one, your present circumstances don't determine where you can go. They, nearly, they merely determine where you start. And I think this is really good. We sometimes let our circumstances define us. We sometimes let the current circumstances that we have define where we're going to go next. But truly, it's a starting point. My dad, my dad has always said to us, he always thought it was the funniest thing ever, he always said, today's the first day of the rest of your life. And, and we always are like, okay, whatever. You know? But truly, it is. <laughs> like starting this moment, everything from here on out is the rest of my life. I get to choose in every set of circumstances what I do next. And for Joseph, he's going to be in that same situation. Joseph is, has been cast in to prison unfairly, he doesn't deserve to be there, but he has to make the decision what he does next. He can either pout about it, feel sorry for himself. Ooh, how about broke a television down here? He can do all of those things, or he can continue to do what he should do. He can continue to live the way he should live. Those are the decisions he makes. I thought that was a really good quote to go with what we're studying. If you're in a bad situation, don't worry, it'll change. If you're in a good situation, don't worry, it'll change. Our life constantly changes. Don't get, don't get complacent when things are good. Continue to try to grow close to God and build our relationship with God because it's not going to be perfect all the time. But there are some days that it's really easy to go, man, this is really good. There's other days that we go, whew, this is awful. But we keep in mind that tomorrow's a new day. The, night, the next hour is a new hour. And we determine through our attitude and through our actions how that works. So I thought that was really good. And the last one, um, 
is, it, it goes back to what Josh said last night, and it's kind of what I want to lead us into our discussion tonight. The most powerful weapon against your daily battles is finding the courage to be grateful anyway. You know, I thought he made a fantastic point last night. That the reason we get down, the reason we get frustrated, the reason sometimes we let this life beat us up is because we forget to count our blessings. You know, even in our worst times, there's still many blessings that we can consider. It's all about mindset. It's all about our mind frame. I, I think it's, it's really important to realize that, that when God makes it very clear that every day is not going to be perfect and every day is not going to be great, that then we have to determine how are we going to deal with those? How are we going to deal with those situations? I, I've often said I, I feel like I'm a very blessed person, um, and, and, I, and I, I, I never want to stand up here and present like I understand the situations of all people who struggle. I don't. I don't. We all have different struggles. We all have different situations. And so it would be, it would be very unfair for me to say that I understand how your struggles are, and it would be very unfair for you to say that you understand mine because we're very different and we're very unique. But if I walk out of the camera and just wave at me, I, I did it a couple times Sunday morning. Um, and, and so I think we're, we're in a very unique situations. We're all very different. But we all have struggles. We all have, have difficulties in our life, and we all have things that we have to make decisions as to how we're going to work through them. But I think this is a great quote. The most powerful weapon against your daily battles is finding the courage to be grateful anyway. How do we do that? By counting our blessings and realizing that God never left us. No matter the battle, no matter the struggle, we can be grateful anyway because we're not there alone. We're not there by ourselves. And the one that made us is the one that goes through there with us. So as we get our run and go tonight, about seven verses I want us to go back to from last night. He didn't cover all the way down through here, so we're not totally reviewing it, but I do want to start up in 19 where he was. Genesis 39, 19. It says, as soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled, and Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. I, I think there's a, I just want to draw a side point to this real quick before we, before we get going because I think it's really significant. I think when we act like God's people, in our situations, people are going to want to give us responsibility. People are going to want to trust us. People really, whether they'll admit it or not, people like to be around God's people because they know we're trustworthy, they know we're kind, they know we'll treat them the way we should treat them, and they know they can always count on us to be where we need to be. You see, if you, if you think about God's people through time who have been in situations like this, think about Joseph right now. What is it? He's placed in favor. Now, we do know that that's, that's got a tremendous amount to do with God. But we also know that he acted as one of God's people. See, if he'd chosen not to follow God, God's not going to put him in favor uh, with, with, with the folks in the prison. So I think it's interesting. I, you, think about, you think about Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Think about them. They continually show growth. They continually, because of who they were, God's people, they stood out among everybody else. Brother, I think it's just significant that we can be like Joseph, and this, is, this isn't necessarily where I'm, where I'm supposed to go at all tonight, but i got a couple extra minutes, so I'll say this. I think when we stand out in this world, it's how we truly are living for God. It's what God wants us to do. He wants us to look different. And I don't know about you, but I like godly people around me. I like godly people in my circle because I know who they are. True godly people are trustworthy. They're wonderful people who want to do right by me. And sometimes that's hard in this world, isn't it? Sometimes it's hard to look around and figure out who you can trust. But true godly people, our brothers and sisters, we know we can trust them. And I think here, when we think about Joseph, when we think about the fact that the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison, whatever was done there, he was the one that did it. And here's, here's what's interesting in 23. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge. Why? Because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. 
Everything that he did was through God's plan. And God was interacting there without question. But when we do things in God's way, people trust us, people appreciate us, and people want us around them. I don't think there's any doubt about that. So, so we review here and we see that he's in prison, though. Let's, let's not keep this in mind. I'm, I'm, being, I'm being ultra positive for a guy who just got thrown in prison for absolutely no reason whatsoever. So for me to talk about that, well, i got to bring you back down. He's in a bad spot. <laughs> he's in prison and he doesn't deserve to be, so let's, let's set the context the way it should be. So as we go to 1 through 4, it says, Sometime after this, the cupbearer, the king of Egypt, and his baker committed an offense against the Lord, the king of Egypt. Against their Lord, the king of Egypt. I'm sorry. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them. They continued for some time in custody. So a couple things here. We see now not only is Joseph in prison, but now with him is going to be the chief cupbearer and the baker. Um, they committed offenses against the king of Egypt, and so they're going to be placed in prison. And where are they going to be placed? With Joseph. So we have these new prisoners arrive. Joseph is appointed to be with them. He's going to be there with them. And they're going to be in custody for what was defined as some time, a period of time. So, again, I think Josh started, uh, made this point last night. We're not talking about a couple days. I think it's important to remember that. That, that this is not just, I go, go hang out in prison for a couple days. I'll see what I can figure out. This is a period of time. And so here to find in verse 4, as they continued for some time in custody. Here's where I think this gets really good, starting in 5. It says, In one night they both dreamed the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison. Each his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in the master's house, Why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, We have had dreams, and there's no, and there's no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. So he comes to them, and, and they, they, they're here in prison with him, and they have these dreams. And after they have these dreams, he recognizes that they are, some versions, troubled. That, that they're troubled. They have this, this look about them. This, 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 I don't know if you, you recognize that about people sometimes, when they just have this feel about them that, that something's on their mind. And so he recognizes to them that they are Troubled, it says here in the, in the English Standard Version, uh, he saw that they were troubled. Uh, when, when Joseph came to them in, in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in the custody in his master's house, why are your faces downcast today? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? So he immediately recognizes that something's wrong. And so he's going he's gonna to ask them that. But I think the really cool thing that he says to them when they say, we had these dreams, what's he say? Well, God has the answer. Even though he's in prison and he doesn't deserve to be here, even though that, that, that things haven't gone the way they should have, all through 39, he did exactly what God wanted him to, to do. He ends up in prison anyway, and even though all of that happened, he says, well, God has the answers. He immediately refers to God. God is the solution. He recognizes God as the solution, even in his bad situations, even in his times of doubt, even in his times of struggle. And I think it's significant that we understand that, that God is the solution no matter what our situation, no matter how things are going for us. We have to allow God to be the solution. And that's what he says to them. Over in Acts chapter 16, a very similar situation occurs. We see here that Paul and Silas are, what? They're in prison. And guess what? Once again, God's people are in prison and don't deserve to be there. You see, I, I think sometimes we, we get this mindset of I do everything that God wants me to do. I try to live the way God wants me to live. I, I mess up every once in a while because I'm, I'm imperfect. We know that. But, man, I work hard to live the way God wants me to. And then, look, something bad happened to me. How could that happen? Scripture's filled with, with, with times when this happened. It's why we have this subject tonight. Because we have to keep in mind that just like what happened in Scripture, it's going to happen to us in today's world. That sometimes things are going to be bad and we don't feel like we deserve it. 
And sometimes things are going to be bad because we did stupid stuff. <laughs> and we do deserve it. But not always. That's not what happened here with Paul and Silas. And we go into 16. We, we see this. It says, as we were going to the, pl- the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of, div- of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you by the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turns and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. So, so this, this woman who was, who, who was possessed, that, that had the Spirit in her, and Paul turns around and says, get out. See, we would think that, hey, he did God's work. He did a good job. He did God's work. Well, here's what happens. Verse 19, but when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. Why? Well, they cost them money. Keep that in mind. That's really what's happening. They advocate, they advocate uh, customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they inf- inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So keep in mind, here's what's happened. Here's what happened. The crowd joined in attacking them. So they're attacked by the crowd, okay? And the magistrates tore their garments off of them and gave orders to what? Beat them with rods. And they had after they and when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison. So let's let's make sure we understand this is how it happened. They were beat many times for doing what? God's work. For doing right by this girl. They're beat many times. And they're thrown into prison, but not just into any prison. They're thrown into the inner prison. Like their maximum security. <laughs> That's where we're going to put them. Because they might get away. So not only have they done God's work, they've gotten beaten for it, and then they've been treated like these awful criminals that are going to try to escape. That's what all has happened to this point. And I want us to keep in mind as we think about how, how Joseph said, well, God will interpret your dreams. God will take care of you. He, they immediately go to God. What do these guys do? They go, man, God, why'd you let me get beat up? Why'd you let us get thrown in prison where we're doing your work? No, they didn't do that. Look what they did. About midnight, verse 25, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. After they had been cast into prison, after they had been beaten, their garments torn off of them, people joining in to harm them. And then cast into the inner prison, they do something that you and I sometimes don't do on our best days. What are they doing? They were praying and singing. They were glorifying God. When we have doubt, when we have struggle, when we have difficult times, do we pray and sing or do we pout? Because unless, unless there's a verse 24.5, there's nothing in here that says, and they laid there and cried and they pouted and said, God, why'd you do this to me? It never says that. It just says they sang and worshiped God. Kyle got excited. I thought it was a good point too, Kyle. So, so they, they sang and worshiped God. They praised Him. And you know what's really cool about that situation? Going down here to... Uh, well, let's just keep reading. And suddenly, verse 26, there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prisons were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Now, I want, I want you to keep in mind this, this situation right here. To this point, they've been singing and praising God, even though they're in prison un- unrightly. As this earthquake happens, and, and the assumption is that they've all left because that's what a normal prisoner would do. But the jailer's getting ready to do what he needs to do because if he don't kill himself, I mean, we, we've seen these guys have just been beaten. They didn't kill people nicely back then. So he's like, man, I better just do this myself. It's going to hurt less. And as he prepares to kill himself, Paul stops and says, whoa, 
Do not, verse 28, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought him out and said, now here, notice this. He brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, to this point, best I can tell, they've been praying and singing. When did they preach a sermon? When did they put their t-shirt on and said, I'm God's? They didn't. But in their toughest, most difficult moments, in moments when they had the opportunity to have doubt, in moments where they had the opportunity to pout and cry and feel sorry for themselves, they lived for God and people recognized it. See, sometimes in our situations, we have the opportunity to use them for someone to become a child of God. Him and all of his house did it. We get to choose what we do with doubt. We get to choose what we do with bad situations. And please don't think I'm preaching at you because I'm bad at it. A lot of times I feel sorry for myself way too often. These guys didn't. Had they have, you think he would have said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? No. He'd probably been like, why didn't y'all leave? Why didn't y'all leave? <laughs> Should have left. Because he wouldn't have known. But he knew why they were there. They were God's people, and they continue to be God's people even in bad days. And because of that, it says this. Well, once I get back to Acts 16, we'll see what it says. Acts 4 doesn't talk much about it. It says this. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31, and they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. His family became Christians because when Paul and Silas had the opportunity to say, poor pitiful me, when Paul and Silas had the opportunity to have doubt in their life and to say, why has God betrayed us? Why has God left us? When they had the opportunity to do that, they chose to be near him by singing and praying to him. And he saw in them people he wanted to be. See, I think when people really, people, people really in their toughest times, they're going to find hope somewhere. They're going to find hope somewhere. And the question is, do they find it in us? Do they look around and go, man, whew, he went through some tough stuff, but he always did it with a good attitude. How'd you do that? And the answer is, I have God. See, that's when we have our chances to teach. Paul and Silas made a positive impact. I've said this before. I'm sure you remember everything I've ever said here. It was a long time ago. I, I believe this with all my heart. We never have interactions that lack impact. We never do. Walk past somebody who really likes you and don't say hi to them and see if it impacts them. You literally did nothing. <laughs> literally did nothing. I don't know if you've ever done that. If you've ever been at work and you're just a little bit busy and you walk past somebody, they're like, I'm not what did I do to make you mad? You walked right past me and didn't say hi. No, I was just in a hurry. You know, that impacted them. Until the next time they saw me, they sat around and thought, what's wrong with him? You see, every interaction we have, even some of the ones we don't recognize, have impact. They had impact. It was positive. Because they chose for it to be in a negative situation. We don't have to have negative impacts in negative situations. We choose that. But I promise you this, in every situation, we're going to have some kind of impact. If I go around pouting and I go around yelling, and, and again, I'm not preaching at you because I do all this sometimes. If I go around pouting and being in a bad mood and letting my situation run my life, I promise you the majority of my impacts are going to be negative. God doesn't want negative impacts because there may be that person that says, that's because I, I can promise you this, you, the things that put me in the worst moods are not that big a deal. But they're not usually that big a deal. But that person who's really going through something that's a huge deal, why do they want to be like me? He can't even handle this little bump in the road. How is his faith going to make me better? See, they saw in these guys a group of people who knew they needed God. And guess what? 
Joseph knew the same thing. Proverbs 3, 5 through 8. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make straight your paths. We use this Sunday, by the way. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. You know when we mess this up? You know when we mess difficult situations up? When we try to do them on our own. We try to do it our way. Where's God gone? Oh, poor pitiful me. This is just awful. I'm good at that. God's not good at me doing that. He doesn't want that. He wants me to lean on God. We're going to have to move on or we're not going to finish. Over in verse 9. It says, So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream there was a vine before me. And on the vine there were three branches. And as soon as it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. And I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, This is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head, your head and restore you to your office. And you shall place Pharaoh's... Sorry. And you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as, for, as formerly when you were his cupbearer. Only remember when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh. And so get me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have been nothing that they should put me into the pit. This is really interesting to me. So he's going to interpret his dream. He's going to say, hey, man, I got good news for you. I'm going to, I'm going to give you some good news. In three days, things are going to go real well for you. And you're going to be restored. It's awesome. But then he says this to him. He says, I do need a favor. Remember me, remember me when you get back up there. Remember me. Tell them, tell them what I did for you. Because you know what? A couple things happened to me. I was stolen out of the land of the Hebrews. Talked about that just a little bit last night. And I've also done nothing that I should be in this pit. See, here's the interesting thing about it. Joseph, did, Joseph didn't forget that he shouldn't be there. He was very well aware of his situation. Like he wasn't oblivious to the fact that he didn't deserve to be, he didn't deserve to be in prison. And as a matter of fact, he didn't deserve to be where he was in the first place. He was stolen out of the land and stolen out of his freedom. But you know what's interesting is that's really the only time he mentions it. Like, there's no recording here of, of him saying, you know, you guys think you got it bad. <laughs> Tell you what happened to me. He doesn't seem to be talking about it. Now, maybe, maybe there's, there's some other discussion. Obviously, we don't have recorded. They were there for a pretty good period of time. But here he's going to tell them, I got good news for you. This is what's going to happen. You know, what's interesting is, is he, he, he makes this request down in 14 and 15. He says, only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of the house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I've done nothing that they should put me into the pit. You know, I think we should be able to make requests of each other. I think part of, of, the, of the, the beauty of the church is we're not like this guy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to throw you a little bit of the end here. I don't want to ruin it, but it's not all of it. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you some of Zach's for tomorrow anyway. So we, we, here's what's going to happen. He's not going to do it. <laughs> like, he's going to give him this good news. He's going to interpret his dream. What's he doing? He's walking around all sad-faced. I mean, that's what it basically says. You, you know, I can read on your face that something's wrong with you. He's going to cheer him up. In three days, things are going to be real good for you. I got good news. So he interpreted his dream. He, By the way, just to, just to go back to what we talked about on Sunday, who did he give credit to? Just like Moses did, he gave it to God. God's the one who interprets these dreams. He didn't say, look how powerful I am. If you'll get me out of here, I'll interpret some more of your dreams for you. He didn't say that. He just gave credit to God. He asked him to get him out of there. He's not going to do it. But I do think that, that when we ask things of each other, that we should count on them being done. And, and I just thought that was an interesting piece here that I wanted to throw in to our lesson. Philippians 2, 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. What's going to happen here in a few minutes is, Things are going to go, this, this dream, it's going to be interpreted right. It's going to go really well for him. He's going to have the chance to help the one who gave him the good news, and he's not going to do it. 
As Christians, we can never be like that. When our brothers and sisters have need, we need to make sure that we look not to our own interests, but also to the interests of others. John 15, 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. What's the love that's been given for us? The love that a son, the only son of God, came to this earth and died for us, selflessly hung on that cross in cruel pain, and defeated death so that you and I could go to heaven. That's the kind of love that's being discussed here. That's the kind of love we should have for each other. The cupbearer is not going to have that love for Joseph. So on down to the baker's dream. It says here in 16, When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket, there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, "Keep this. watch this right here. This is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift you up your head from you and hang you on a tree. And the birds will eat the flesh from you. A couple things about this. So, so interestingly enough, this, this baker, he, he's like, hey, listen, his dream went well. <laughs> this guy's giving good news today. Bring it on, Joseph. And he's like, yeah, man, three days you're going to die. He gives him the bad news. He shares with him the truth. You know, I, here's what I pulled from this as I read it. I, I, read, it, I read it a billion times and, and just wanted to know... Um, I, and just kind of wanted to draw what I, what I really could come to the conclusion here with. And you know what I came up with? Sometimes we got to tell the truth even when it's not fun. Joseph could have said, hey, buddy, you'd be all right. <laughs> it wouldn't matter. He's going to be dead in three days anyway. He could have said, ah, turn that frown upside down. It'd be okay. He didn't do that. He told him the truth. He said, this is what's about to happen. See, for you and I, that's what's hard. I don't think it was hard at all for him to interpret the cupbearer's dream. He gave him great news. In three days, three days, you're going to be sitting pretty. That was easy. See, it's really easy when someone asks us a question to give, them the, to give them the good news. But sometimes we have to be ultra honest with people. We have that responsibility. I think we do it with love. But Joseph had a responsibility. He gave credit to God for interpreting his dreams. He couldn't make anything up. He couldn't lie in the name of God. So he tells him the truth. See, I think that, that was hard right there. He locked in prison. You know, I mean, nobody wants you. Nobody, you're, you already got some bad news going on. You're in prison. <laughs> like, the day's not going great anyway. Then you go and throw him some more bad news. But he did it because that was the truth. So we have to have, be willing to have the hard conversation. And many times it's the hard conversations with people that we love. And I think as Christians, that falls on us. When we know the truth and people aren't following the truth, I don't think we go stand on street corners or, or go out in the middle of them and hold up signs. Or I heard a guy one time say, he went to, to congregations of, of these religious bodies and sat on the front pew and yelled out the Verses, that, I don't think that's it. I think it's having true, honest, loving conversations with people and telling them the truth of Scripture. Joseph had to tell the truth. It would have been easy to say, you, you'll be back baking too. <laughs> he could have said that. Do we do that sometimes? When, somebody, when somebody's talking about something that is in violation of God's will, we're sitting around eating lunch or whatever, and they're like, ah, yeah, they, you know, no, you, do it, you do it your way, I'll do it mine. God just don't care. And we're like, oh, yeah. Do we ever do that? Because that's not the hard conversation. The hard conversation, well, Scripture says, this is what we're supposed to do. Why don't we do it like that? I think we have to be willing to have the hard conversation. Joseph had it right here. In prison, in a very difficult time for all three of these, because they're all in prison, he tells the truth. Colossians 3, 9 and 10 says, Do not lie to one another seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of the Creator. Telling the truth can be hard, but God desires we do it anyway. He does. God did a lot of hard things for us. God is with us every day in our hardest situations. 
He expects us to stand up for his truth. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together. Speaking the truth in love. Now, I think there's two keys to that. I think we have to speak it with love. I think if we stand up in a pulpit, if we stand up in a class, or if we sit down one-on-one with somebody and we disagree scripturally because they're in violation of God's will, I think we still present it with love. They have to see that. See, I, I think sometimes I think sometimes we really get to the point, um, and I, I've, I've often believed this, I, I think we get really defensive because people often disagree strongly with some of the things that we know to be true. And so sometimes we get so defensive that we're trying to win an argument. Winning an argument and breaking up a relationship to ever be able to teach again, it's never going to help. Driving wedges between people so we can tell them that we're right about Scripture and they're wrong is not going to help us bring them. Honesty is required, but honesty with love is necessary. Why am I telling you the truth when you don't want to hear it? Because I love you. It's hard. And sometimes people still aren't going to recognize that. I, I, think, I think I would be in a fantasy world. I, I, I think I would, be, I would be teaching you out of a fantasy if I said, well, that's not going to offend somebody, even when you speak truth and love. It, it, it absolutely does. But I think it lands the right way when we're less argumentative and more loving. I told the story of, of teaching somebody one time, and this person consistently um, wanted to tell me what their preacher said, and I consistently wanted to tell them what I knew. And so, and, and this person, um, if I if I told you who it was, I, I just felt like they should trust me, you know. And so, like, well, he said this, and I'd say, well, but this is the truth. We went back and forth. I got real mad. And, and like a couple days later, I, uh, we, we got into that conversation again. And it just clicked. It hit me. I was like, why am I talking? <laughs> like, that guy's got a doctorate. I don't. So automatically they think he's smarter than I am, although I don't think he was. And so, but in, in her mind, he was. So I said this. Well, over here in the book of Acts, it says this. Why does it say that? And I learned something real quick. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter if I'm smarter than that preacher. That's not what my work is. Let him be smart. Let him have his doctorate. I'll take my little degrees that only have two letters, you know, without a period. And, and so we'll, we'll, do, we'll do that. That's fine. I guess they have two periods. I think I had more. Um, and, and so I, I'll, I'll take my little bit of knowledge, and he can take his doctorate, and that's fine. It doesn't matter. It's not about me. It's about God. So I just started opening up Scripture and saying, I don't know why it says that, because God says this. Because I know this. God's burning both of us. (laughs) And I had His words right there with me. You see, sometimes we we don't want to tell the truth, but we have the truth in our hand. So we just show it. Explain to me. Get Him to explain it to you. Why God's wrong, because this is what He says. I think that's when we really have to, that's what our focus has to be. So I think we have to speak the truth even, even when it is hard, as I, as I put there on that slide. At the very end here, um, verses 20 through 23, I, I really couldn't give this slide a title, so I just gave it three. God was right, the cupbearer was wrong, Joseph stays in prison. That's, that's kind of the, the three titles. I, I couldn't decide which one I wanted, I gave you all three of them. So in verse 20, it says, On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants, and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. I told you that was going to happen. So what happens? Exactly what Joseph had interpreted. Everything Joseph had said, why? Because he used God. He interpreted it through God, so there you go. God was right. The cupbearer was 
supposed to remember him. He didn't. The cupbearer was wrong. And Joseph stays in prison. I told Justin last night, he said, Are you te you're teaching tomorrow night? I said, yep. Got bad news. Joseph's going to be in prison the whole time. And he is. He should have gotten out. If he could have trusted the cupbearer. But he didn't. I got Zach's teaching tomorrow, so he's getting out tomorrow. So we, we see here that he stays in prison because the cupbearer doesn't do for him what he should have done. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. I think this is a really interesting scripture when we think about the work that Joseph did. If Joseph had been focused on the flesh, he would have been really angry. He would have felt really sorry for himself. He would have felt hopeless because he was in prison. And his whole attitude would have been different. But what we're doing, the work that we do is not fleshly work. And we have fleshly jobs. We have, we have worldly jobs that we do. But at the end of the day, what supersedes all of that is that we're doing God's work. The war we fight is a spiritual war. And when we get ourselves out of this mindset that all there is is this earth, and we get up to the world, or get up to the, to the heavens, and our mindset is on God, we stop fighting fleshly war and we start waging the war for God. See, that's what Joseph did here. Joseph had every reason to say, I don't know what God's done here. Remember when Moses, a couple weeks ago, what did he say? God, you sent me here and all it's done has gotten worse. <laughs> you know, Joseph had a chance here to be like, you know, God, all through chapter 39, I did what you told me to do. Here I am in prison. But he didn't do that. Why? Because it wasn't about his situation on the earth. It was about his situation with God. Same thing with Paul and Silas. They had every chance to say, God, our time's being wasted here. We're stuck here in prison. We did everything that you needed us to do, and here we are. That's what we do sometimes. I, I, that's what I do sometimes. I shouldn't say we. It's not, not my place to tell you that. I do that sometimes. God, I, I don't really understand why this is working out like this. But the difference for Paul and Silas was, the difference for Joseph was, they knew they had to keep plugging along, fighting the spiritual war. You don't get days off from that. You don't get to throw yourself pity parties. Because in difficult circumstances, we, we have to quit worrying about the flesh and worry about the spiritual results of our situations. James 1, 2 through 4. It says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. This is tough. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. We don't really walk around going, whew, yay, a bad day. <laughs> it's hard, isn't it? It's a tough mindset to have. Whoo, yeah, a bad day. This is going to make me better. It's not the first thing that comes to my mind when I have a bad day, just so you know. But what Scripture says is, it's okay to have a bad day. It's okay when you, when you face trials of various kinds. Because what's going to happen is steadfastness. And when it has its full effect... You will be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. We grow closer to God. We become better when we have that mindset of faith and when we work through our struggles. We don't like to think that tough days make us better. Scripture's always right, and it says that they do. Last one here, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Revelation 2, I love this passage of Scripture. I really, got to, I really got to bring two of my favorites, uh, Paul and Silas in prison, and, and then Revelation 2 is, is maybe my, one of my favorite passages of Scripture uh, that we find. It's written kind of small, and I apologize, but we're going to start in verse 8. It says, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty. Now keep in mind, why do they have poverty? Because in many cases, they were losing their jobs and they were losing their land because they were serving God. That's what was happening here. 
We have to make sure that when we read these, these events that we put ourselves in the proper context. People were, the people were taking their jobs from them. They were taking their land from them. They were losing everything that they had and yet continuing to worship God. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. What? I've lost everything. Well, that's all about mindset. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. And here's verse 10. We love verse 10, but I think we have to really understand its context. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. I want you to think about the situation for these people. They're losing their jobs. They're losing their property. He, he says, but you are rich. They're going, no, I have nothing. But truly, the, the, the richness goes back to the previous verse that we talked about. As they're, as they're getting complete because they're, they're truly serving God. They have God on their side. They have everything that they need because they are servants of God. And, and so we see here that, that you, are, you have poverty. It says that. Slander of those. So not only do they, are they losing the things they have, but they're being slandered because they're serving God. Is that enough? No. And so it goes on to say, do not fear what you're about to suffer. What? What I'm about to suffer? I've lost my property. I've lost my job. People are, people are slandering me. What I'm about to suffer? Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be thou faithful. Now look at this word right here. Unto death. Even if they kill you, even if serving God takes your life from you, and see, this is the situation they're in. That's why I love this. See, we like to read it and say, well, after you become a child of God, be faithful unto death. And just until you die, be faithful. But the truly, the, the true concept of it here is they might kill you. <laughs> You're going to have this tribulation, and even if you die, be faithful all the way to the process of them killing you. Why? I will give you the crown of life. Why are they rich? Because of those last couple words right there. They're rich because what waits for them is better than anything that exists here. That's what we have to remember. It's what Joseph remembered. Joseph knew as he was there that God was with him and God would take care of him. He didn't need to feel sorry for himself on this earth because it's a short time. But what waits is better. What Paul and Silas knew was they had a message more powerful than anything anybody could do to them. And that being in prison was not the same thing as being lost for all of eternity. And so they needed to make sure that being in prison didn't stop them from helping people, for being lost, or than keeping people from being lost. See, that's our big goal. Think about that. Think about when we're down and out. Think about when we, when we let the things of this earth impact us. I think the one question that we have to ask each other is this. Is whatever's going on in my life today worth me keeping or me not having the opportunity to spread the gospel to someone who's lost. Think about that. I have those days when people, I, I, I told them at the office one day, I was like, I, apparently I, I, I said something the other day and, and it must have been hateful, I don't know. Um, it happens from time to time, they'll, they'll tell me, they'll tell you. Um, again, I'm, not, I'm preaching to me too. Um, and I said, you know, usually I know when I'm in a bad mood. Like I guess I, I didn't know it that day. But usually we do. Think about when you're in a bad mood and you want to go sit by yourself and you don't want to be around anybody. Think about when something bad happen, ha happens and the only thing you want to do is go shut your door and not be around anybody. Those are opportunities that we miss to impact people. The moments that I feel sorry for poor pitiful me and I don't have a positive attitude and infect the people around me with positive energy, I have impacted them. I think that's what we have to remember. It's hard, and, and it'd be really easy for me to stand up here and say it never. Oh, you can do it every single step every single day. No, we're going to fail at it sometimes. But I think what Joseph understood was he had a more powerful opportunity because he wasn't fighting worldly battles. He was fighting spiritual battles. What Paul and Silas understood was there's a more powerful opportunity. We're not fighting worldly battles. We're fighting spiritual battles. And I have my soul to take care of, and I have other souls to impact. And they did that. 
They did that. A whole family was saved that night because they chose not to feel sorry for themselves and take off running when their shackles left their arms. They could have done it. Could have done it. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I'd be, I, I don't think I'd be good in prison. <laughs> the shackles fell off, I'd probably be like, all right, I'd probably get on out of here. They might come put them back on. There's no discussion of them saying, hey, Silas, you think we ought to run? There's nothing in here recorded that says that. They stay right there, save the man's life, and because of that, not only do they save his physical life, more importantly, spiritually, he is saved. We lose the mindset sometimes that the work we do is more important than what we can see. And that wraps up with these guys. Revelation 2. You're losing your land, you're losing your, you're losing your jobs, they're making fun of you, they're, they're giving you a hard time, they're mistreating you, and then you're going to suffer some more, and they may even kill you. But I promise you this, no matter what it is that happens out of all this, this is the promise that's made. No matter what happens out of all this, there's something better that waits on you, so just hang on. Just keep plugging along. That's a challenge to us. In times of doubt and times of difficulty, keep plugging along. It's always time to depend on God in times of doubt. You know what's going to happen with, with Joseph uh, is this. I'm going to ruin just a little bit piece of Zach's lesson tomorrow night. He's going to get out. He's going to get out. And actually, somebody who made a promise to him that didn't keep the promise to him is going to then, well, I don't know if he ever made the promise. He was asked to do it. He's going to then do it. They're going to need him again. They're going to need God's person again. You see, sometimes when you think people don't need us, it just takes a little time, and then they need us again. See, he didn't lose focus. And Zach gets a lesson them all night. Because there's going to be trying. There can be triumph for us, always, when we control our mindset and we don't let our physical circumstances control it.